and I'm going to Stanford University tomorrow. And, and I just thought I was going to do that, and then Francesco um, said, um, yeah, you're all, would you go to LinkedIn? And yeah, they're, I don't know who they are, actually. They send me spam all the time. I'm just going to delete. I have no idea what it is, and VMware and people like that. So. But this talk was the most difficult one, because I thought, I, I was expecting, and I have to ask, I was expecting that there would be a very great difference in um, the audience, because I thought there'd be some people who were quite good at Erlang. In fact, the authors of three of the, no, four, hands up if you've written an Erlang book. <laughs> right. So these guys know more about Erlang than I do, and hands up, somebody's written no Erlang at all, is just kind of curious. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I've prepared a talk for that audience, right? Good, that's great. And I was, I was very worried about getting the technical pitch right. So this is, um, I have to apologize to Garrett. You see, Garrett, Garrett's very keen on a title for the talk. Um, now Garrett doesn't know me well enough to know that um, my favorite title for the talk is title to be announced. And, and my favorite abstract is abstract to be announced, but he forces things out of me. So I have to give a title and an abstract. And then usually the talk's absolutely about absolutely nothing about what's in the title and the abstract. And this is also the case today, because <laughs> the talk's actually not about what the title's about, but just have to pretend it is. And I'm, th these are my sponsors. Uh, yeah, Garrett's got sponsors. I'm, I'm a professor at uh, the Royal Technical High School and, and a, senior, a senior sort of technical person at Ericsson. Um, and they let me, by some strange miracle, run around the world and meet interesting people <laughs> and have fun. Right, so, so what's this talk? Well, it's about monads, pipes, plumbing, middlemen, and all that jazz. Um, what's that mean? Well, um, it's all about composing computations. So I'm going to show you this kind of stuff first. And then we're going to have a little bit. For those of you who don't know Alan, I'm just going to show you. Uh, is that me or is that you? We're, we're crackling. And so um, I always wanted to be a magician when I was a kid. So, 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 so to do magic. So I'm going to do some magic. Um, but it will require some of you to, well, you don't need to come up to the stage, but you have to shout out prime numbers. So I tweeted, bring a how many of you brought prime numbers? Yeah, how, a lot of digits in them? How many digits in your prime? One! <laughs> okay. How many brought like a big prime number? How many digits? Oh. We'll, we'll muddle through, perhaps with a nine-digit prime number, but it'll, it will be difficult. But in case any of you haven't brought a big prime number, I've got a program that can generate them. And I can actually sell you prime numbers for, you know, like 50 cents a prime number. Right. But before we do that, let, let's just look at, look at um, um, composing computations. And why, why do we want to compose computations? Because we, we, we want to make reusable things out of small things. We want to take small things and build them into bigger things. And I wonder why we're humming. OK. Uh, still humming a bit. Never mind. OK, so the first part of the lecture is I'm going to compute s the sine of 2 times x. And this takes a mere 36 slides. <laughs> because, because I'm not going to... You know, anybody could show you a program to compute sine 2x in one slide, but I can do it in 36 slides. <laughs> right. And once we've done, and, and we'll visit monads, pipes, and stuff, and the Higgs boson while, while we're doing it. Um, and uh, Curry Howard correspondence, of course. And then, then we'll have a bit of fun with Prime so we can see what it looks like. And then we'll, right, okay, so um, why, why would, what's happening to programming today? This is a great paper. Um, if you've never read it, and, and uh, it's even greater to hear Phil Wadler, um, Mr. Mr. Type Theory Man himself, talking about it. And he talks about the Curry Howard correspondence. What's happened to programming? <laughs> Shit, programming is. <laughs> is. Is it really me? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And, did, and, and my voice is still here. <laughs> yeah. So. So uh, Curry and Howard actually proved that for a certain class of programs, writing that program is equivalent to proving a theorem. It's actually when you, when you, when you, 
when you're writing a type, a correctly typed program, you're actually doing maths. You're proving theorems. There's a correspondence between mathematics and, and uh, programming. And that's rather nice because it puts, puts a small part of programming on a, on a firm basis. But it is, at the moment, only a small part of programming. It's not all of programming. There's a bit of a gap there. There's, we're going to have to wait a few hundred years before we figured out how to, to bridge that gap. It's taken, I mean, Church did the lambda calculus in 1933 or something like that, and then Java 8's introduced it this year. So there is a sort of gap between theory and practice. Of about, it took about 80 years or 70 years before a theoretician says the smart way to do things and it emerges. But, so we can wait a few hundred years and probably we'll have figured out how to program. Meanwhile, we muddle along. And this is, OK, so let's compute sine of 2 times s. That's actually quite easy, but when we start to debug it, it becomes tricky. Right, so why does it become tricky? So, OK, so here's the... This is sine... Well, here's two functions, actually. This is about composing functions. Here's, this is Erlang. For those of you who don't know Erlang, this is Erlang. OK, so sine of x... Uh, well, should I say it's math colon, because it's in a library. Double of x, just x times x. So if you wanted to say what sine of double of x, you compose them. And this thing here, sine of double of x, that's called function composition. Right. So you're all happy with me. Yes? Oh! Sorry, it should be plus. Oh, dear. <laughs> I should get somebody to proofread my slides. That's, yes, that's, yes, you'll never believe anything I ever say again. <laughs> right. OK, so this is... This is a really bad error because, because, because the name of the function and what it does are not the same, which will really confuse you. Yeah, it works with two. Thank you. Right. OK, so when we if I back off and say, OK, so that's sine of double of x, this is function composition, right? And if you forget about the specific sine and double or things, OK, this is f of g of x, or f of x of g of x. Now, functions are composable if you can just wrap them together in these function calls, and that's what we want to happen. Now, in Haskell or C or Java or any of these languages, that function composition will fail at compile time. The type system will say, we will not allow you to compose things together, OK? Because the types are wrong. But in Erlang, haha, you can do anything you bloody well feel like. You just boom together, and you'll, ne you'll know at runtime, not compile time. Now, some people think that that is uh, not so good. And other people think that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this path of telling you why it's pretty cool. It's actually due to late binding. It, it makes decisions late. It makes assumptions about the world that these strongly typed things don't make. It makes assumptions that we don't know about everything about the world while we're doing things, and that the world is changing as we go along. And actually, we can do both, which is, which is the even nicer thing. But I don't really want to talk about that. OK. Um, what I want to talk about is how you change these things. So if we had sine and um, double, we can compose them. But hidden state in objects or in any programming language mean that you can't compose things. Right. So hidden state, which is a side effect, stops you from composing things. So in a, in a pure functional language, uh, you're not allowed to tinker around with the state. So the state must go into your functions, something should happen, and uh, the state comes out as well. So here we've got a function. In a pure functional language, you've got an input and a state, and what comes out is an output and a new state. OK. And that's functional programming. In object-oriented programming, uh, they make a religion out of hiding this state. OK, so you go into the, an object, it can have private state, the state gets changed, and you come out of the object, but you don't know what the effect of the state is. And it's this changes to the state that you cannot see that makes functions non-composable. So I'm going to give some examples of this. Right. So you've got this religion. OK. The trouble is that when different people are doing things to these functions, they start adding instance variables and things in this hidden state that you don't know anything about, and that buggers everything up. So you don't want to do that. Right. OK, so object-oriented programming, this is the art of hiding side effects. Uh, if you can do it successfully, you can write a decent program. If you can do it unsuccessfully, you will get a soggy mess of treacle that will stick around in forever. Right. Oh, I said that already. OK. So 
Carrying this state in and out of everything is extremely inconvenient. You don't really want to say in with state, out with another state. You want to hide this state as much as possible. And the different ways of hiding the state are the things that different functional programming languages offer. In, in Haskell, they're called monads. In Erlang, they're called processes. And I'm going to show you the relationship between the two and how they work. OK, so a monad. So if you look up in the Wikipedia, uh, it says, I'll, I'll read it in functional program. A monad is a structure that represents computations defined as sequences of steps, a type with a monad structure defines what it means to chain operations or nest functions of that type together. And it allows the programmer to build pipelines that process data in steps, right? In which each action is decorated with additional processing rooms provided by the monad. As such, monads have been seen as programmable semicolons, uh, which are used to chain together the individual statements in many imperative programming languages. Right. So, can anybody, let me see, can anybody tell me what the most important word is in that? No, well, that would really scare people. But, but there's, a, there's, a, there's one word in there which I think is more important than all the other words. Which is the most important word in all of that? Fred. You'll know. The most important word. I guess monad is the title. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Well, we can, have vote, we can have vote, you know, who thinks monads is the most important word? No, 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 no. Okay, so who, pipelines. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, pipelines is the most important word. So the, the, the monad is a, is a pipeline. It allows you to pipe the output of one function into the input of the next function. So they've rediscovered the pipe. Right. So let, let's kind of look at what happens here. OK, so uh, goodness, what the heck am I doing here? We've got sine and double, but double isn't double. It's times. And then we've got sine of double is double. Is double, is double, is double. OK. So what we can do is define a function called compose in Erlang. This is compose. Compose of f and g is a function of f that computes f of g of x, n. And then we can say that sine double 2, it's a different way of writing it, is just compose the function sine and the function double. And th that's a kind of messy notation in, in uh, Erlang. But it's a very nice notation in Haskell. You just write, you just write this dot. You know, you say sine double is f sine dot double. And there's no x, there's no arguments, it's very short, it's very clean, it's very much like mathematics. It obeys the rules that mathematics obey. So we're fine here. Erlang and Haskell are good friends. They have the same semantics. Um, and uh, the only thing that differs there is syntax. And we don't care about syntax. Nobody cares about syntax. Well, apart from people who think they have to be commas at the end of lines or semicolons. Who cares about syntax? syntax. Right. So let's add debugging. OK, so we want to trace what's going on. So we want, we were just, you don't want to say sign got called when it got called, double got called when it got called. And um, well, the thing about pure functional languages is, is, is you're not allowed to do side effects. Now, just printing something out, sign got called, that is a side effect. So the fact that sign got called has to be an output of the function, right? So we've got to rewrite sign. I'll call it sign underscore d. And it's math colon sign of x. And it's, and it's a string. Sign got called. OK. And double of x is well, it's still not double. It's times. Uh, this is not a deliberate mistake so that I can make jokes at every point when I get to this. <laughs> it's, it's a bug which I didn't notice. And I never ran this code. So <laughs> just wrote it. Oh, I did run it. I don't think I noticed, actually. <laughs> uh, OK. So, um, so we got sign and double. Hey, wait a moment, look, Mar, I've broken compose. Goodness gracious, you know, now I just say, well, compose the debugging versions, and it's broken. So I've made it non-compositional. Oh, isn't that horrible? We lost, we lost composition. So what do the functional programmers do about that? Well, OK, so we, we, we could, of course, redefine compose to a version of compose that works with things with the debugging stream as well. But that would be horrible, because that would mean we would need a compose to compose pure functions. We would need a compose to compose functions with debugging. 
and we would need a compose for every type of thing you want to do on the entire planet. So instead of changing compose, we'll keep compose exactly the same, and we'll, we'll write a little function that takes a function that doesn't have debugging and returns a function that does have debugging. And if we have a function that accepts only one argument, which is the, you know, the, the undebugging version, we'll add another little function that automatically adds an argument to it. Once we've done that to that, we can then call Compose on it, and everything will work, and it'll be nice, and it'll be hunky-dory, and there will be peace on the Earth, and everybody will have a good time. Right. So, because once we've done that, we can bung them in a pipeline. Okay, so... What we want to do, sine of double of x, there's two ways of thinking about this. One is the, the functional notation. We could say sine of double of x, or we can think of the pipeline notation, where we think of a number in flows into the double function, flows out of the double function, flows into the sine function, and flows out. You know, and there you've got your answer. And the nice thing about a pipeline is it's quite easy to see that you can do all the steps in the pipeline in parallel. Okay? So we have a a function, or we have a type describing this process of the number, number goes to number, goes to number, goes to number, and we get, what, F-O, we can write? Oh, I don't know what that means. Never mind. <laughs> okay, right. So, we can write a function, bind. Now, bind is a function that takes a function one argument and returns a function of two arguments, one of which is the, 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 the stuff you would have got if you called the first function, and the second is all the stuff that came in composed with or added to all the stuff that came out. So the input argument to this is a function x, f of x, you compute it. Well, that's going to be a function that returns two things. And the second thing it returns, this string, is concatenated to the extra string that came in. So that's a lift function, okay, or bind function. Hooray. Now, once you've done that, you can apply that to your fun sign d1 and your fun you call bind on it. And it lifts you up into this space where you can do Compose. So now we can do Compose on it. So, hooray, Mum! We've saved the world. We've got, composition we've got compositionality back. And that's wonderful. Right. So functional programs, they've got all these weirdo diagrams which nobody understands. Lots of arrows in Greek all over the place. But what are they saying? They're saying, well, OK, so we've got this world where we can do, you know, we've got our A world. And we'll call this function bind on our A objects, lifts us up to another world, and then we'll do computations in that other world. And once we've got an answer, then we'll drop down to our original world, and it makes life simple. And we're very used to this idea. Uh, perhaps not, but 20 minutes left? I haven't even started. <laughs> you remember, I've got 26 slides on sine and double. Can I have five minutes over then? Because I started five minutes late. Um, this sort of idea is very common in, in a lot of disciplines, in physics and things. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you've got some sound waves, music or something like that, and you have a, a time-varying sequence of numbers, that represents sound, and you want to remove the high frequencies, you do a fast Fourier transform, you do a Fourier transform on that. And that turns that into a set of complex numbers representing the power at different frequencies. And then you just chop off say the high frequencies or the low field frequency, whatever you want to do, and you do a Fourier transform on that, or an inverse Fourier transform, and you get back to the original data. And that's your audio wave with the high frequency components removed, or the noise removed, or whatever you want to do. So you, you started off with audio data here, done a Fourier transform to get up there, you've done stuff on the Fourier transform, you do an inverse Fourier transform, you're back again, and you've done that stuff. So we're very familiar with that idea of changing the domain to solve the problem. Once you solve the problem, you drop back to the original domain. Right. And that is, okay, so back to Erlang now. Well, I haven't actually got to Erlang yet. So in Erlang, meanwhile in Erlang, f of g of x is used for what I call small steps. And pipes are used for big steps. The big step semantics, these are processes. These are messages between processes. They're used for big computations. When you've got f of g of x, they're small steps. And we map small steps onto the same core. We map big steps onto processes. Processes map onto multi-cores. The system just does it for you. It, you don't need to figure that one out. But you as a programmer do have to define the granularity of the computation and what the steps are. So we pipe things together like this. So, you know, I, I sort of ask, how many people think parallel programming is difficult? Yeah. Usually all the hands go up, actually. Um, and then I say, well, hang on, you know, like, find, start, or Earl, Gret, Fred, that's a parallel program. 
you can run all these steps in parallel. That kind of parallel programming is easy. So in fact, the parallel programming is difficult. It's got nothing to do with the intrinsic difficulty of parallel programming. It has to do with the notations you use and how the semantics of those notations can be made quite easy. We can automatically parallelize this. You can't automatically parallelize the small step computations. That's extremely difficult. Right. So in Erlang, we don't call them pipes. We call them processes. And uh, so here's, here's my goodness. What does this do? This does actually do double, doesn't it? You see? You send a, you've got a doubling process. <laughs> Haven't you? <laughs> no, sorry. A, a squaring process, I should call it. A squaring process. Gets an input, squares it. That's easy. Right. So remember, small step function called big step processes. Function calls run sequentially, processes run in parallel. So we've got a nice way to think about parallel programs. Talk pipes. Well, pipes. This is uh, McIlroy's. This is the stuff that started pipes in Unix. McIlroy was, was Koenig and Richie Boss. And he wrote a memo and he said, we should have some way of coupling programs like a garden hose, screw in one segment and then... That's, how, that's programming. It's gardening. Gardening, right. He conceived Unix pipes which allow programs to work together with no knowledge. He, look at this. He allows programs to work together with no knowledge of each other other than they're connected. And yesterday, I, I connected Erlang to Sonic Pi because um, Sam Aaron was at, was at um, Strange Loop and we, we got talking. And he said, yeah, well, Sonic Pi actually uses UDP packets with uh, open sound control on top of it. And it's port 554558. Five, five, if you send an OSC message to port 558 containing a Ruby program, it will execute it. And I've done it. So I have an airline program that generates a Ruby program that sends a message in a UDP message to a port, and it plays a sound. It's fantastic. I jumped for joy. It was wonderful. It was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Pipes. Um, uh, pipes. Uh, pipes. 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 Um, if you're building a system, I recommend going and looking up plumbing recommendations, right? Because the pipe location in your home is very important for popular, ma popular maintenance and water flow. Many pipes are located in walls, floors and ceilings and hard to locate. If you have no idea where a leak is coming from, you want to call a professional plumber who will have the equipment to locate the pipes in your walls, floors and ceilings. So he's talking about software, isn't he? You know, the router's in the thing, all these wires all over the place. And you call the guy who knows where the router is and what the cables do and then you'll fix it. This is exactly the same type of problem we have in plumbing as we have in software. Okay. We don't know what's connected to what, and it's a mess. Right, handyman tips. When you move into a new house or property, try to locate the main stopcock, which shuts off the water supply uh, to the house. And do not wait for a major problem when it will be too late. Okay. What's that called? Who's built websites? Flow control. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, suppose you don't know where the main stopcock to the water in your house is and the sink's flowing over. You're screwed. You're running around. How do I stop this stuff? How do I stop this stuff? Okay. Find the main tap. I think that's... Is that called faucet here? Yeah, I think so. Right. Uh. Fit service valve to all your pipes. Okay. Flow control. Overload protection. This will allow you to work on the bathroom sink without affecting the supply in any other place. Don't have messy cables. Um, this was the analogy I always used to use when I was teaching Erlang um, a long time ago. These are, these are what, what's that a picture of? What's that thing? It's an Erlang process, that thing there. And that's an Erlang process. So, so what happens if you want to, you know, want to, Debug a system. If you've got a buggy airline process it, well, hopefully you've done what he said, fit taps on all the pipes, which you should have done. You get all these pipes, you turn the water off on all the pipes. You take a hacksaw, you saw through the pipe, you lift out this thing. You get another boiler. You lift it in, you weld the pipes together, and you turn on all the taps and it works. Okay. This is called boiler replacement on the fly. And, and Erlang's also kind of laugh occasionally when I say that. Um, 
This is what you do in Erlang. You replace processes on the fly. You don't take them. You, you sort of... All the connections are there. They're still sending things. You just replace what's going to be done. This makes you, this makes you be able to roll over different generations of things. Right. Middleman. This is the key abstraction in Erlang. The funny thing is, I don't, I don't think I even say it in my book. And Do you say it in your book? This is the... This is the you see, the Erlang model of the world is that everything in the world is an Erlang process that speaks Erlang messages. But in fact, the real world isn't like that. It's, it's lots of other things. So, so what you do is, whenever you've got any problem whatsoever, it doesn't matter what the problem is, you put this transducer thing in the middle that translates between the, 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 the way things talk to each other in the outside world and the way things talk to each other internally. In the, in the, so, so if you've got HTTP, you have a little HTTP parser. In come get requests and put requests and things like that. Out come Erlang terms. You don't, this isolates you from the horrible details of HTTP or you know, whatever the protocol might be. So the middleman creates the illusion that everything in the world is an Erlang process. So this is actually, this is actually the thing that now makes them composable. Since everything is an Erlang message going to a process, it is composable with all other processes. It's automatically composable by construction. All you have to do is put the patterns in that do the, the various things. And that gives you conceptual integrity everywhere. So the middleman is the thing that imposes Erlang on the, on the, on the, in the Erlang world. So look at this. If you've got this kind of thing, if you suppose we've got Spanish, Japanese, French, whatever, people trying to talk to each other, the complexity of a program for two people to talk to is of order n squared. But if we put middlemen there, right, so they all talk Swedish. Well, or you could put English in between if, if, uh, if you wanted to. This turns the complexity an order n problem, instead of an order n squared problem. And when we're connecting lots of components together, this really makes the systems work simply. And this is how we manage to compose large Erlang systems. Once we've got into this world of Erlang messages and processes, uh, life becomes easy. We move them out on lots of different processes. If we want to scale horizontally, we scale horizontally. If they die, we, we put new ones in. It's all quite nice. So the middleman, that's the Higgs boson of Erlang. It's the, the bringer of unity upon the world. Right. And now we have the joy of big nums and term to binary. So, what? Oh, I can tell you that. That was secret. So, who's got a, let's say, who's got a, fine, who's got a prime? How long have I got? Ten minutes. This is, I'm going to show you some Erlang, right? But that's for the people that, who don't know Erlang. Right, so, uh, let me see. Demo is prime. This is where you ask for prime from the audience. And we'll, has anybody got a prime? Shout it out. 52. 52. Does anybody buy this guy's book? <laughs> right. Anybody else got a prime? <clears throat> Seven. It's not big enough. Twenty-three. Thirty-three? Twenty-three. 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 Yeah. <laughs> this isn't quite true. Um, if you've got a big prime, this is a function, is, is prime, which is not Boolean. <laughs> It's, it's true or... Well, it's, a, it's actually got four things. Um, it would say true if it was a prime, definitely. It would say probably if it was a really big number and it kind of figured out, yeah, I have no contrary evidence that it isn't a prime. It would say uh, no if it wasn't a prime, and that would be with 100% certainty because that's due to a theorem of, of Fermat. And if you gave it a very large Carmichael number, it'd say, are you trying to kid me? <laughs> it doesn't actually... Actually, if you give it a Carmichael number, it'll, it'll say uh, false, because it's a smart thing. Right. And if you don't know what a Carmichael number is. OK, so a bit of trouble making primes here. And, you know, if, you, if I shout out for a big prime, so two ways of... You've got a big prime. Uh, 32 million. Wait a moment. Just <coughs> shout the digits out. 3, 2... Yeah. 
Probably. Yeah, it's 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 not really. But okay, so I'll I'll assign <coughs> wait a minute, I'll assign that to a variable P. Okay, like that. Right. I actually like a slightly bigger one than that. So there's two ways of doing this. I I can say uh, uh, let, let me say I could say make prime uh, I don't know. I don't want it to be too big. I mean like um, and, and sort of figure one out if you. Uh, I just keep it on the screen, um, and, and I'll assign that to a variable Q. That should do. Q. This what you're seeing is the, it's called the LM shell. Right. So there's there's another prime. Um, this prime is generated by um, OpenSSL. If you didn't believe the prime number generator in OpenSSL, there's another one which. Um, uh, let's, let's suppose you thought some nasty person had got inside the prime number generator SSL and corrupted it, and you want to have your own one. And what you could do is just give the thing yourself as a seed. I might do that, actually. Let, let's forget P and, and make a slightly bigger P. I could say P <coughs> is demo colon, uh, let's see, prime from. And the I just give a sort of number like that. And there's entropy, you say, and then it's there. Right. So, unless somebody's planted a bug in my DNA so that they've corrupted this prime number generator, we think we're okay, and we hit dot there, and, and every dot, then it's looking at that number, and that number plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, no, actually, it says it's even, so it turns to odd number, and then it looks at that plus two, four, six, eight, ten, testing if it's a prime, until it generates a prime. So here we are, we've, we've, we've got a prime, and we haven't relied upon any libraries, really. Well, we have relied on one thing, um, it is prime test, and, and that's the uh, Miller-Rabin test, I think it is, um, that I've done in Erlang. And, and actually, uh, there's another thing. Is if you multiply these two numbers together, uh, if you say demo colon is prime so P, probably, yeah, and Q it will say probably. If, if we say P times Q, they say false, it's not a prime. So the thing about multiplying prime numbers together and, and asking the question, is this thing a prime number or not? If you get the answer false, it's not a prime number, it's a composite number. You can have 100% certainty in the fact that's true, because that is due to a theorem, a theorem of Fermat. It's got nothing to do with, with um, programming. It's to do with maths. So here we're in this world of certainty where maths rules. Okay. So we've got our two primes, P and Q. So what do we want to do with them? Well, we'll do, we'll do this. We'll say E, D, N equals... Demo, make, key. And we'll give it P and Q. Okay, whoa, isn't that lovely? So, this in Erlang says, call demo, make, key of P and Q, give it two primes, out come three numbers. One of them happens to be a prime, could be any prime, it happens to be 65537. Some people might know why, other people might not. This is another prime, sorry, no, it's another number. This is the product of P and Q. Right. So, let's suppose we've got a secret. Right. So, what's our secret? We'll call our secret. Our secret is, of course, a number. One, two, three. No. What? One, two, three, four, five. That's our secret. We've got a secret. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Right. So, what we can do, we can encode that secret. We can say encode equals lin colon pow of... What do we call it? Secret. E. What if I call it E to the N? So when we've encoded it, it looks like, what is this POW? POW is secret to the power of E, which is 65537, modulo N. It's the beta B mod C. That code <coughs> is three lines of L, four lines of L, and nobody's put a bug in it. I wrote it. Right? <laughs> So the encoded thing is that. Right. Now suppose we want to decode it. Ooh. I send, so I encode this ooh, secret, one, two, three, four. I compute secret to the power of E mod N. I've got my encoded message. I send my encoded message over HTTP, over... I don't need a secure socket. Why should I need a secure socket, for goodness sake? God, come on. I'll send you that number. 
person receives it, what do they do? They, of course, do Lin, Kong, Pao, or Enk, to the D mod N. And out comes one, two, three, four. So this pair of numbers, six, five, five, three, seven, and that big number N, there's another name for that. That's called a public key. D and N, that's called a private key. So this is RSA cryptography, okay? So I've shown you everything. I don't really need to show you Miller Rabin and things like that, that's easy. But what about this demo make key? That's where the magic happened. We took two prime numbers and we got three things out. So this must be a really clever bit of code. So, so let's look at that. Right, so, where's email? Oh, it's not email. Tell you what I'll do, I'll just stop this. And less, oh, okay, we'll stop there. We'll do less, demo, uh, prime. Oh, this was primes from, uh, I mean, primes from, just generate prime n plus one. And, and, uh, I mean, that was easy. This is our code for those of you who don't know it. Um, where is, is prime, make prime, make key, there you go. That's the magic. Right. N is P times Q. 5 P minus 1 times Q minus 1. E is that constant. N is lin colon inverse of E phi. That just solves the linear quadratic. A itself, A, B, C, G, solution, E itself. It's, what's it called? I can't remember what it means. Gone. It's very simple stuff. If I check the code back, gone. And out comes that. That is public key cryptography. I think everybody should understand public key cryptography because there are nasty people who want to mess around with your computers. Okay? If you take SSL or something like that, you've got thousands of lines of C which you can't understand. If you do an airline, you've got 50 lines of airline which you can understand. And it's done in big numbers, so it's really easy. And it's left. Right, so let's show you what you'd have to do to make it. Oh yeah, okay, so that, that's the joy of big numbers. There's two other things in airline, really nice. Term to binary and binary to term. Term to binary takes any term turns it into a serializable string, send it down the net, binary to terminal on the other side, reconstructs it, put it in a database, do anything you feel like. That's why React, CouchDB, Cloudant, all these things are all written in Allen because it's so easy. Right, database, yeah. You know why there's a, yeah, it's easy to write your own database now. That's, that's why, hey, anybody put that, but yeah, right now. Oh, here we go. What I showed you was textbook RSA. Um, it relies upon the fact that um, if I say, is that a prime? It's very difficult to ascertain. Well, okay. I know because it's actually that product. Uh, how much more have I got? Right. Oh. oh, this is what I've shown you. Yes, it said, um, do live if time permits. I've done this. Right. That's, all the code. that's all the code. That is RSA now. Uh, to me, that's very understandable code. I cannot understand the open SSL libraries to do that. I mean, there are like thousands of lines of big ones and stuff. Oh, dear. It turns out that some naughty people, or some careless people, has, has um, perhaps made a little mistake in that. I don't think I've made any mistakes in that, but leak stuff, we'll see. Well, that's Miller Rabin, the only bit I didn't show. Uh, um, turns out textbook RSA isn't really good, because if you encode the same message twice, you always get the same answer. If you could, if you could tell somebody, you know, say, suppose I encrypt an Allen program with pure RSA, um, somebody might give them the program and say, well, actually, I know, and then it makes it, uh, you know, from being a colossally difficult problem that would take 100 universes to solve makes it solvable in half a universe for computer time or something like that. And so what you do is you, you twiddle around with the bits and things using something called optimal basic padding, that's also an Erlang. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that algorithm there is that in Erlang. Um, it's pretty easy. Now we're using binaries and <laughs> bit matching and that's a bit, a bit more tricky, but it's pretty short. And then I'm going to just show you the, the result of all of that. If you put it all together, you make a secure file system, which I've built. And, uh, and then you go to, you say, well, a web address it could be something like this, foobar.com, for, that's a port, and that's, a, that's a, actually an SHA1 checksum, and it's the SHA1 checksum of the public key of the server, and that's the address you, you hand down a bit of paper to people. Um, and that is computed, this... SHA1 checksum is computed as the SHA1 checksum of the website 
with its port number concatenated to the public key of the server. Okay, there's a look it up on the Wikipedia, self-certified file systems, and read the thesis of David Nazaris. This is a brilliant thesis. It's not, it's very easy to understand, um, and I'm just really surprised people don't use the results. And uh, so basically what you've done to set up a secure connection is you, you, you tell the server, hey, I want your public key. You get the public key back. You compute the SHA1 checksum of the public key of the server address. You check to see if it's the same as the thing in the reference. And if it is, you know you're okay. You know, you know there's no... Well, if there was a middleman, it doesn't matter. They, if they changed anything, uh, the key would be wrong. So the checksum would fail. Okay. Then what you do is you generate a, a, a key pair, a private, a temporary key pair, a private key and a public key, and a session key. You encrypt the session key with your private key. You send the public key and the encrypted session key back to the server, and then the server sends you its own key. You have two pairs of keys. You cross them and use them to initiate a stream cipher. Sounds complicated. Well, that's it. That's the start of it. It's not all of it. And it, and it says, connect to that, OK, PID, safe TCP term connect. Um, the TCP thing is sort of unsafe if you send it, if you open it in packet four mode and you don't send it packet one of it might read too much. That's a small correction to that. This sets up an abstraction. Remember I talked about middlemen? It's actually a middleman so that all these messages turn into LM terms. You send a term, a third line at the top, you send to the server pid bang get server pub. That's just a message. You send me the public key. You wait. You get back a term representing the public key. You, make, uh, you check the server hash. And you say, case god of hash. Yeah, it's the one I, th the one I thought it should be. Hey, that's fine. So you make a new session key. That's a, that's a crypto new session key. You encrypt it with the server public key. You send it back and you, you do all that. And this is actually equivalent to, although different from, the SSH handshake that's done when you do an SSH session. Only this way, I think there's, there's, there's relatively little black magic in it. If, you, if you've understood the RSA bit, the rest just falls out because it's really simple. And actually, the proof of RSA is not particularly complicated. If you've done high school maths and stuff, you, you would understand that proof. It just relies upon the fact that if you, if you compute x to the a to the power of b, it's the same as computing x to the power of b to the power of a. And one guy's got a and the other guy's got b. And then both of them compute x to the a, b by retaining sort of half that information. That's why it works. OK. So now, let me see. Oh, oh finished. <laughs> right. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> no questions. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Somebody else? Thank you. So to, to get back to the, um, the first part of the talk yes. uh, and the, and the, the monad and, and process correspondence, is, were you moving towards a sense in which something like, say, uh, practically it would be a gen event running a logger or something like that, but some other process is sitting outside the pipeline of computations and available at any point to receive serialized messages from them that would serve to say, we call it sign, we call it double, et cetera? I, uh, if not, I, I think, I'm not sure what the correspondence is. Well, no, what yeah. the correspondence there is, is, yeah. is that um, the way you... S if you're thinking airline terms, and you see you've got a process here, and, and it, you should think of it as having sidebands, you know, not just talking with one process identifier, but talking with two or three. And each, each one, if you, if you were to draw it as a black box, you'd have a box like that. We wouldn't have one arrow in and one arrow out. You'd have, like, three arrows in and three arrows out. And, and one arrow would be the sort of what you're doing. The, the other arrow would be um, where the debugging stuff goes. In fact, that's what actually happens in Erlang. When you, if you call IO colon something, you know, for the IO to work, it calls something called group leader. Group leader returns the PID of a process that's doing that stuff, which is just kind of hidden from the user. And, and then you send messages to it. So we've actually set up a sideband for doing all this stuff. So, so basically, I'm sorry, you, you do sort of inband and outband computation. Inband, you just do what you're supposed to do. If anything, abnormal happens, you do outbound stuff and you send it on these other, other process channels. And of course then you, you stick a logger in or whatever you feel like. Yes? Oh, uh, not 
Way to get us a little bit off topic, but have you seen any serious effort um, utilizing uh, GPU? Have I seen any serious effort at using GPUs and Erlang? And then could, um, I mean, no, not really. Well, not that I'm aware of. But GPUs are, are kind of um, all the CPUs are doing the same thing at the same time often, and it's rather difficult to get them to do different things, and they do small things. Um, on the other hand, the, the architectures which are extremely interesting are the network on chip architectures. The, the, the parallel machine and things like that um, uh, are within a, a they're very near to being. Okay, so, so at the moment, parallel board has got 64 cores with, I think, 32K of memory in each chip. If you put, say, a half a megabyte in each chip, then they become the perfect machine to run Erlang on. And those are going to scale up to about a, a, a 1,024 cores with a meg of memory. The designs are available, but the chips haven't been manufactured yet. Um, so then the, we were well, not over GPU architectures, but over network on chip architectures with reduced instruction set computers and high, high bandwidth interconnects between them. And these run at very low power compared to, I mean, they're about 100, 100 times the price performance of an x86. Optimizing the big cores is something that's not understood. So, so you, you do Erlang on a eight core machine. You don't really understand. You you tweak it to make it go faster, and then the next day there's a 128k, 128 core machine, and the tweaks you did on the 64 core machine don't work on the 128 core machine. And, but we're leading the pack there, so, so, so we, we get their stuff first and then try and tweak Erlang. But for Erlang programmers, that's irrelevant. You write your program with lots of processes, processes, and not much sequentialization. Stick it on a multi-core. Our goal is if, if you add n cores, it will go 0.75n times faster. If you get a 100-core computer, our goal is that you go 75 times faster without doing anything at all to your program. The reason that will work is because of the memory send said that's stupid that's crazy that's and then for five years they said well that might work and for the last and then for ten years they said hey that's a cool idea do it like you do it in that way <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you go on, <laughs> joe will be around at break uh lunch after party, so we have lots of access to him. So save your questions for him and, and, and conversation, beer time, that sort of thing.